I got copies there. I drove 300 miles down and back in six hours in the car and all that, and he ain't even paying me. So if you want to help me out, <laughs> if you want to help me out a bit, you could like buy a book. But I'm not going to read those poems. I'm going to read the stuff that I have written in the last year and a half since these were published because I just feel like it. Um, and I'm going to read them in the order they were written. There's about, I don't know, 13, 12 or 13 of them. We'll see how long they take me. Um, but I just thought, what the heck? These are the newest things and the things that are, I like them. I don't get to read them. I mean, I don't do this much. So here we go. Um, so th this is the longest night of my life. We've been humping the boonies up by the DMZ for a couple of weeks. November 1967 hard work, and every night a new fighting hole, and the one-man poncho tent. This night we were on the side of a hill. I didn't bother to trench my tent. It wasn't raining, and the soil farther south had never needed that, and I was tired and fell asleep fast. But I woke up later to find myself in the midst of a raging river cascading down the hillside. It was raining, and the soil up here absorbed nothing. Raining hard, cold in November, me utterly soaked already, teeth chattering, no dry clothes, no place dry, middle of nowhere, sunrise hours away, five, maybe six hours. I don't know where these things come from. Um, the muse is, is she shows up sometimes and says, write this down. And then she goes away for ages and ages, and I don't know where she's gone. But in this, this collected poems is arranged chronologically, and if you look at the table of contents, there are years when I go an entire year and I write one poem, or maybe two or three poems. I don't know, it's scary. Um, this is another war. Uh, you'll, you'll figure out when I wrote this. Last night it rained and then turn cold. Today the trees are coated in ice, every bare branch, every tiny needle on the evergreens. Now the sun's come out, the sparkle on the trees is dazzling, enough to lift the heaviest heart, enough to make you think this world's not so helpless as it seemed last night. Last night, Russian missiles hit Ukraine and Russian tanks crossed the border, headed for Kiev. Who's at fault? Who did what to whom? No doubt the fingers will be pointing 16 different ways to Sunday. Anymore, it's hard to care whose fault it is. It just keeps happening. And after seven decades plus, I finally can't avoid accepting that there's nothing I can do about it. This is simply what and who we are. This is how we'll finally nail shut our own coffins. Grant me the serenity. Listen, you can hear the little chunks of ice tinkle softly as they hit the ground. Poetry in Motion. So my buddies and I are eating a pizza in a picnic pavilion in a public park in Bridgeton, New Jersey. And this guy in Bridgeton Municipal pickup truck pulls up and stops, gets out, pulls the top off a trash barrel next to us, pulls out a loaded trash bag, ties it shut, and without even looking, throws it back over his shoulder one-handed, 20 feet into the truck bed. Clunk. Perfect. Beautiful. <laughs> Fishing for Winter Flounder. Uh, I refer to DC in here. This is my friend Don Cassidy, not District of Columbia. <laughs> fishing for Winter Flounder. Well, okay, DC said that we'd be fishing for Winter Flounder, but it was already March. In Philadelphia that day, dawn sunny and 60 or 65. So I was wearing sandals and shorts. 
had the top down on my MG midget when I drove over to Cherry Hill to meet up with Jack and DC. <coughs> the three of us took DC's car to the inlet behind Ocean City. By the time we got there, the sky had clouded over. The temperature had dropped to 40 or 42. It was drizzling, a kind of soupy mist that burrowed deep into the bones and stayed there. And my sandaled feet sank nearly to my knees in the tidal salt marsh. And my two jackass friends were actually having fun. <laughs> Wouldn't leave. Made me stay hour after agonizing hour, freezing, shivering, miserable, maybe the longest day of my life. And I didn't catch one lousy fish. Not a <laughs> zip, zilch, bloody hell. This was in 1975. I've never gone fishing again. <laughs> That's the truth. <sighs> Through the looking glass, and this has a, a, a quote from Lao Tzu as an epigraph, when the wise man points at the moon, the fool looks at his finger. <laughs> it doesn't take a philosopher to notice that there's no shortage of fools in this country these days, walking around in combat camo, openly packing assault rifles, wearing glocks to the barber shop. Hey, look at me, I've got balls. Even the women, for goodness sake. Or the folks who believe a woman's body is not her own business. And women on public assistance are freeloading welfare queens. Teaching our children the actual history of slavery is un-American and gay pride is abomination. Violent insurrection to halt the peaceful transfer of power is legitimate public discourse and half the nation is ready to vote again for the grifter who won't admit that he lost. Speaking of which, what about that big, beautiful wall Mexico was going to pay for to keep the dealers and rapists out? And wearing masks to prevent the spread of COVID clearly violates my right to be stupid. Meanwhile, the whole planet is bubbling away like a pot on a stove on high, and the cook's asleep at the wheel. I know, I know, a mixed metaphor, and I have to admit this isn't much of a poem, but at least I can see the moon. It's up there, grinning like the Cheshire Cat. <laughs> well done. No, wait a minute. If you're going to clap for that one, you mean you didn't like the others? <laughs> oh, right. Now what am I going to do? You didn't leave a pause. You, <laughs> you got to leave a pause. But now I see. After a poem, because that my react is Jesus, they didn't like the one. So just save it all up till the end. And, and if you like, you, you can really applaud. And if you didn't like, you, you can applaud because I'm done. <laughs> Everybody wins. To the future. On behalf of my species, I'm sorry for the mess we've made of this planet. It must have been a nice place before we got here. Even as scary as the dinosaurs were. They didn't cause their own demise the way we've engineered collective suicide. What else to call it? How could we avoid the warnings? How could we avoid the warning signs? Talk about denial. But we did year after year for decades until it was too late. And then all hell broke loose. The mad scramble to evade the hurricanes, tornadoes, flooding, glaciers melting, ice caps shrinking, oceans rising, burning forests, burning prairies, burning cities. Those with the guns took what remained of food and water, as if their might could somehow alter the laws of physics, till they too were drowned or starved or broiled alive. Whatever you are, wherever you are, if you're reading this, I send my apologies, and I wish you wisdom greater than ours. Oh, here's another. This is like... Oh. <laughs> this, is, this is called When I'm Gone. Now, you've never heard of Arlie Bialanko. She's just a friend of mine, but she wrote this really sweet thing to her husband, and I read it, and I stole part of it. What she said was, when I'm gone, I hope I live in the low-lying fog that blankets the tops of the little mountains around here in the mornings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Up in the mountains of Pennsylvania. Uh, and I, so that's an epigraph. Here's the poem, when I'm gone. 
or maybe in among the leaves of those magnificent old trees you love so much. Wouldn't that be something? Just a whisper, just enough to let you know I haven't, I haven't really gone so far away, and I still love you even now, even forever. So let me be a whisper in the trees, a gossamer wisp of fog, a twinkling star in the heavens of your heart to guide you through the years ahead until we're both where we belong, arm in arm, out there in the cosmos. Now I'm going to break the, the silence and, and applaud it with my voice. Thank you. I, and the, you know, I'm 74 years old and I'm, I ain't going to last forever. I went through the windshield of a car when I was 15. I had a close encounter with a rocket propel grenade when I was 19. I drove drunk for 50 years. <laughs> finally, I finally, <laughs> with some encouragement from the Radnor de Police Department and the uh, uh, Delaware County Court of Common Pleas and the Pennsylvania Department of Motor Vehicles, I finally decided I maybe I ought to do something about that. Um, but in any case, something's, I've had two bouts with cancer. So I don't know how much longer I'm going to last, and uh, but I got it all figured out. I'm going to be buried in New Jersey. I own a piece of New Jersey, which is really fun because I once got thrown out of New Jersey by a maple shade cop who literally said, "Get out of New Jersey and don't come back." Freaking maple shade cop! <laughs> I couldn't believe it, but I couldn't say anything because I had about a half a pound of hash strapped to my foot. <laughs> and all I needed was for this guy to take me in. <laughs> But I found out last year that I could have a green burial in this cemetery in the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. And it took me like two and a half weeks to buy the plot and get a funeral director, all everything. So I'm going to be planted in New Jersey when I croak. And the worms and the, and the flowers will have a field day. And there's nothing that stupid cop can do to throw me out of New Jersey. <laughs> this is Team Photograph, 1957. Ten of the kids sit on the diving board, two in the water below the board, two young coaches stand by the kids, years before speedos, of course. They're wearing a hodgepodge of bathing suits. As you look at the photo, the kid three in from the left is me. The kid to my left is my best pal, Jeff. I've thrown my left arm over his shoulder. I like Ike was the president then, one of the girls is big for her age. One of the girls will soon be pregnant and forced to drop out of school. Another will die of a heroin overdose. One will marry four times, four different times, have four children by four different men. One has a sister whose husband will beat her to death. One of the boys will join the Marines and survive a tour in Vietnam. Another will join the army and die in the Central Highlands. One will kill himself with a shotgun after he's exposed as a queer. One will become an anti-immigrant racist. None of us knows any of this. We are all smiling. Oh. Mm. We published that poem in Beltway Poetry Quarterly, so you can read it there. Thank you. We also nominated it for a pushcart well, prize. Notice I'm wearing my Smedley Butler T-shirt. Anybody here heard of Smedley Butler? Um, he, he's a really <laughs> very fascinating character. This one actually has a picture of me, but you can't see it. Smedley Butler's buried in a cemetery up by Westchester, Pennsylvania. Um, and I went to visit his grave, and this is originally enough called as Smedley Butler's Grave. So here I am with Smedley Butler. Major General, Maverick Marine, Old Gimlet Eye, the Stormy Petrel, two-time Medal of Honor winner. Me, a sergeant with a purple heart for doing nothing but getting hit. Don't kid yourself, there's nothing heroic in that. Just bad luck. Yet here I am at Butler's grave. But why? Well, we were both Marines, there's that. And he graduated in 1898 from the school where I taught decades later for 18 years. And he wrote a book called War is a Racket, in which he concluded to hell with war. How can you not love the guy for that? 
The day I discovered racism, 1965. We were driving an English Vauxhall we bought in Santa Rosa, New Mexico for $67 and the trade-in for our ancient Chevy that had blown an engine the night before and now sat useless along the interstate west of town. The Vauxhall didn't have a speedometer or any other gauges, only empty holes in the dashboard where gauges should have been. No gas pedal, just a metal pin through the floor. No gas cap, no oil cap, no windshield wipers, and no headlights until we found the switch box beneath the back seat and hooked it up with masking tape. The heat kept melting the tape, so we had to retape it every hour or so. But we'd gotten as far as Louisiana. Early morning, a two-lane road through cane fields and cypress trees and bayous when we got a flat. And of course, no spare tire. So we're sitting there by the side of the road, scratching our heads and wondering what to do next when a car pulls up and two black men get out and ask if we need any help. And we're starting to explain when a pickup truck comes to a screeching halt and two white men get out and start pushing and threatening the two black men and chasing them off with a warning to leave the white boys alone. Then, as nice as can be, they offer to drive us to the nearest town to get our tire fixed, and they treat us to breakfast while we wait for the tire, then drive us back to our car and put the tire back on before wishing the four of us a safe trip home to Pennsylvania. And the four of us are all going, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Family secrets. My mother taught retarded kids for 25 years. That's what people called them back in those days, even mom. It wasn't an insult, just a statement of fact. She'd spend all week teaching Albert to count out 35 cents, a quarter and a dime. By Friday, we could buy, he could buy his own lunch. By Monday, he'd forgotten it all. She'd have to start again. She did this with Albert for years. She'd laugh when she'd tell me the story of Albert, but she never gave up on the boy. And Albert had it better than some. He wasn't stuck in a wheelchair, didn't crap in his pants or wave his arms around like he was being attacked by a swarm of bees. My mother loved those kids, and she was good at what she did. Once I asked her how she managed all those years without succumbing to despair. Teaching retarded kids, she replied, was easier than dealing with her husband and four sons. I thought at the time she was kidding. <laughs> no regrets. I'm always amazed when people say they have no regrets. Robert Redford, for instance, Ingrid Bergman, Elena Kagan, Drew Barrymore, Susan Gale, Jennifer Aniston, William Schreier, Henry Kissinger, for Christ's sake. <laughs> Are they serious? Lying? Delusional? I've got more regrets than I can count. Taunting David Schmitz to the point of tears, calling Barbara Kaufman barn for years, putting my father out of the car on US 309. How he got home, I never asked blowing up frogs and firecrackers, killing a pregnant snake. That and a whole lot more, and that was before I even got out of high school. Then I joined the Marines. You want to talk regrets? How much time do you have? Blood on my hands for killing people who didn't deserve to die, helping to turn a country into a graveyard, receiving medals for doing the bidding of leaders who should have been doing time. Heard enough? I'm only warming up. Making my mother cry for giving me a tie at Christmas with a Liberty Bell motif. None too keen on the USA after that war. Kicking my wife out of the car in Carolina, throwing up drunk in front of my daughter. How do you live a life with no regrets? St. Francis, maybe. Mother Teresa, Gandhi, Henry Kissinger. <laughs> Certainly not me. Teaching my father to hug. 
I had to teach my father how to hug. For years, he'd grip me with both arms, one hand on either bicep, firmly holding me away, uh, firmly holding me away from him, our bodies never touching. I've no idea why. Men don't hug. Afraid he once held tight, he'd not let go again? Beats me. But in my 30s, I got married, and he'd hug my wife the same way. <laughs> I finally decided this would just not do. Every time he tried to grab my arms, I'd step inside his grip and pull him close to me. A bear hug he could not escape. I did this time and time again until he finally got the hint gave up and hugged me back as if he meant it. We had our problems, Dad and me, a lifetime of arguments and ugly moments and miscommunications, but he learned to hug before he died, and I felt pretty good about that. Mm. And this is the last one. And this one I owe to our host. <laughs> It's called How Poems Get How Poems Get Created. A fellow poet was planning a dinner before my reading, and he asked me if I had any food restrictions. I'm not too keen on Brussels sprouts or eggplant, I replied. He said, now that is a poem, my friend. It wasn't, but it is now. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Thank you. Thank you. Would you have? Would you take a couple of questions? If anyone would like to ask Bill anything at yeah. all about his, I, yeah, I'll answer questions. All right, I'm gonna. I, I'll shut off the re the recording right now.